Hello everyone. So this is a follow-up of a previous video I made about a month ago on my retro MIDI setup. I showed a bunch of MIDI devices, both inputs and sound modules that I regularly use with my vintage Macs and PCs. They are well known to the computer retro gamer of the late 80s and 90s, thanks to game companies like Sierra Online and Origin, which were really proactive in making compatible music for them very early, very aggressively almost. In order to help me use these devices on a regular basis without committing to any particular one, I made this selector board. Since a big part of the retro stuff I do involves gaming on both the Macintosh and IBM compatible worlds, I like having choices for music and sound and I'm not alone. Like the title of this video says, I'm going to show how I design my own 3 input, 3 output selector using a piece of perf board and how I stumbled onto a slide switch type that wasn't perfect for the setup. I learned some things along the way and by the end I have an even better solution prepared, so I wanted to share this. So for whom is this video for? If you have more than one MIDI module that produces sound and don't want to unplug and replug your cables and you don't want to use a through port because it's not possible or desirable, then stay tuned. If you have more than one MIDI source like me, like several vintage Macs or PCs or both, and maybe a synth controller, then also stay on. For me, I had precisely three inputs and three outputs, and so that's what I set out for. I bought a bunch of extra MIDI cables, soldered some wires on a perf board, got a label printer going, and arrived at this. Everything is identified for easy selection, only one choice for input is possible, and it links to only one choice for the output. There's no electronics shenanigans going on, no resistors or capacitors, it's only simple wiring. Every choice you make is functionally the same as if you had a straight cable going from your input device to your output device. So let me show what I got to make this happen cheaply. At the end of the video, I'll show you a ready-to-go solution I designed that you'll be able to purchase if you don't want to mess with breadboards or with soldering like I did. First off, components. From cheap sources like AliExpress or even Amazon, I got a selection of perf boards of different sizes years ago, which have helped for various prototypes. I also like and use breadboards, but one accidental ejection of a wire and you could be sent into a debugging spiral for hours. Perf board is that level of good enough when you don't want to enter the rabbit hole of PCB designing and manufacturing. That's where my heart settled on this time, but more on this later. Next off, you can get some dirt cheap sets of 10 DIN 5 MIDI sockets, AliExpress or Amazon again, and they're fairly standard. I found that there's not a lot of variations on the same theme here. And last but not least, a good set of rigid insulated wires that you can strip to the length you need. Next, you must study the pinout of the MIDI socket. The pins are not numbered in order, and I find that you must be absolutely clear on which side you're looking at things. You'll find diagrams out there on the web which show the pins from the point of view of looking in front of the socket, facing the holes. You'll find diagrams where the backside meant for a breadboard or perfboard is shown. Sometimes it's not crystal clear, and I kind of hate that. Please do unambiguous diagrams, such as this one. The pins for MIDI transmission you need are number 4 and number 5, shown here. Number 4 is for the voltage VCC reference level, often 5 volts. Number 5 is for TX, or data line transmission. You'll also see the central pin 2 referred to as ground shielding. You don't need to connect this to anything since it's already taken care by the MIDI cables you'll be using already. 
So all we have to do for our selector is to dedicate a side for inputs and another for outputs. We need an input pin 4 to be connected to an output pin 4. We need to do the same for pin 5 at the same time, meaning we have to enter the wonderful world of slide switch terminology. We need to use a double pole switch since two circuits have to be established as closed. I don't want to dive into every switch possibility here because it would be extending the scope of this video too far out. But let's do a quick crash course. Most people are aware of the dead simple on off switch. That would be called a single pole, single throw switch. Single pole because only one circuit is being closed and single throw because only one choice makes electricity flow. If we go to double pull, then we can close two parallel circuits at the same time. But here we need to have something that gives us three choices, or at least three throws, and we don't need the off option at all. The best thing would be to get this switch function called on, 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 where the first on selects the first input, the second selects the second, and so forth. At no point is an off needed here. In the end, a double pull three throws switch is needed to select which input will be used and from which MIDI pins four and five, we will draw the source of MIDI data pouring in. We need the switch to send out that choice to the output side where a similar pattern in reverse will happen. The switch will select which device will be getting that MIDI data and two circuits or two pulls have to be selected. That's the theory of it, but I screwed up when I bought my chunky switches from DigiKey because, well, there are hundreds of options and you kind of have to know the definitions of the keywords used for switches, and I was still a noob when browsing for it. This led to this video's learning moment part one. The pins won't fit in the holes, but I quickly decided that I would lay them on the side. Their frame even helps the whole structure to stay raised above whatever table I'd set it on. However, what I got was a double pull four throw switch, but which connects adjacent switch pins together. I thought I'd just ignore one of the throws, possibly using it later for future expansion. Let's begin with the first pull for ease of understanding. Let's do it for the first of the MIDI pins we have to deal with, MIDI socket pin 4, for starters. The switch I got also has 5 pins, let's name them A, B, C, D, E. And when you slide the switch around, you connect two adjacent ones together. So A, B is your first choice, then B, C, then C, D, and so forth. You could be naive and think that gives you four choices, but you have to remember that the signal has to get out from there somehow. To make a story short, I wiggled my way out of this problem by deciding that my MIDI sockets pins number four would enter in pins A, C, and E, and would exit through B and D linked together. Let's see how that looks. The first switch position links A and B. The signal enters in A and goes out B and D linked together towards the output side. The second switch position links B and C. The signal enters in C and goes out again into B and D linked together. The third switch position links C and D. The signal again enters in C and goes out in B and D linked together. If you paid attention, this is a repeat of the second switch position. That's a drawback I have to accept. The final fourth switch position links D and E. The signal enters in E and goes out in B and D linked together. So crisis averted, I got my three choices to work. However, I have to pay for it by having a redundant choice in the center. No big deal. I can maybe choose my most popular selection in the center so I can switch to it almost blindly. As for the output switch, everything is in reverse. The choice from the input side switch arrives into pins B and D linked together and the switch positions decide if A is linked or C or E is linked to those. 
And finally, what about MIDI socket pin 5, which must also be routed? Well, since those are double pull switches, the exact same kind of wiring must be done underneath the perf board. Here's the underside when it was finished. But wait, initially I did another mistake. I misread MIDI wiring diagrams for MIDI out, which led to learning moment part two. My mistake was linking the central ground MIDI socket pins number two together. I thought I'd even have to use yet another switch for them, which made me scramble to find triple pole switches. But these get much more complex and worst of all, much more expensive. When you check the diagrams carefully, these are not regular ground connections like you would find in an actively powered circuit. They're just linked to the metal shielding of a cable to prevent outside electromagnetic interference. My mistake was to go out of my way and solder a solid path between every single one of them, like so. The worst thing that happened because of it, well, it still kind of worked. This is a nasty kind of bug where you're not punished for it right away. As soon as the soldering was finished, I tested every three inputs with every three outputs one by one by having only one cable for each at a time. Everything worked fine and the four unused sockets were electrical dead ends and of course didn't create problems for me then. The bugs started happening with everything connected and when I was using my SC30 with Cubase sending out MIDI signals. If I disconnect my cable going to the selector, the MIDI activity is no longer drowned out and it is active again. Then replugging drowns in again and so forth. I scrambled to find the problem with multiple ideas. Was there an issue with cable length and drawing too much oomph from my SE30, which, to be frank, has an aging power supply? Was there an interference with ground levels from other devices on the output side, since not all is plugged in the same power bars I have under my desk? I was circling around this issue and having a hard time at getting to the root cause of it. I asked around and found people who studied electric engineering in college, but since this is about vintage MIDI schematics, they didn't know, unless they've worked with this in the past, and they haven't. The issue is too subtle to immediately come to mind for them. I was asking wrong general questions on ground and voltage levels without showing the dang MIDI schematic, which I feel would have solved everything on the first day. On top of this, I stumble upon a compromise solution. If I disconnected every input devices on my switch except the one I wanted to use, everything starts working again. It took making a detailed post on All About Circuits forum to finally get to the bottom of this issue, bringing attention to the original ugly JPEG MIDI schematics, probably dates back from uh, the 1996 internet era, was the key that made user xreader raise the issue about ground MIDI socket pin. After some quick desoldering work, everything made sense again, I was happy, all my use cases worked, the selector behaves as it should, and I don't have to physically remove or insert those chunky cables again all the time. I even got a label printer to properly identify my devices and slap them on small pieces of cut-out foam core that I glued on the edges of my switches. The result is a cheap selector that doesn't cost much, and it just works. So, what happened after? Well, thanks to a comment on my original MIDI setup video, this led to Learning Moment Part 3. A noob learns PCB design. Thanks to my friendly vintage Mac community, shout out to Ron from Ron's Computer Videos, Godbomb, and Eric from Blue Scuzzy fame, I got some pointers in using both the free KiCad and the free Easy EDA but I went with the second in the end to make sourcing the parts uh, much more easy. After a few iterations and some help 
from Polpo, known for the Pico Gus project, who found a very cheap, although puny, switch. I solved a few problems that my prototype has. Number one, I used a proper double pull three throw switch without the awkward extra clone choice in the middle. Studying their data sheets is the key step here. It has a pin that's larger than the others and it's the one you use for your outbound selection in the input side. Here are the three switch positions and the signal enters either from one, three or four and exit out the large pin two. For the board's output side, everything is in reverse. It enters the large pin and exit out the small pins. Here's what my simple PCB looks like. I added some flair to it and I am ready to make my first prototype manufactured soon. I realize not everyone needs to have a 3x3 switch. Maybe you have less devices. So I also made a more humble 2x2 variant seen here. The plan is to make those available on jcm-1.com, which is Joe's Computer Museum store. It's a great place that sells doodads for vintage Apple II computers, vintage Macs, and vintage PCs alike. It's the permanent home of the Pico Gus sound card that imitates a Gravis ultrasound for your old ISA bus PC. It's based in the US, while I'm personally based in Canada. I'm about to order a first run of them to see if it works and if everything goes well, I'll have some extras to sell from my place. For a limited time and people should just pick the choice that makes sense for the number of devices they have and for the local shipping fees they have. So I imagine some out there would enjoy this. It's great if someone ends up buying this and enjoys this. My purpose was mostly to get going with a simple win in PCB design, and it took me a day or two to get there, so I'm happy. I'll update the links to this video when a store page is ready for them. So I hope this video was informative to you. As always, I appreciate your continued interest and time you've spent watching this video. Consider sticking around with a sub or expressing gratitude with a like. That's my reward when I make these videos and I don't aim to be sponsored for the time being. It doesn't make sense with the time constraints I have, at least for now. Before I leave, I want to show something fun with the selector. I'll play something and go to each device during playback. This is perfect to show the differences between devices. In order for this to work, I gotta first prime each device with the beginning of the song, since that's where instrument selection happens. Then I launch it a final time and move from one module to the other. I'll use a highly recognizable song. Enjoy! So I've got my Roland MT32, my Roland SC88, and my Kawai G Mega LX. They've all been primed up uh, previously with Doom, and they all received their program changes that happened at the start of a MIDI music playback. So let's just run it. This is a G Mega, and I'm gonna switch to the Roland Sound Canvas. Back to the G Mega. Kinda have to play with the sound volume. And now MT32. Sound canvas again. It's kind of messy because of the trailing notes. This is not really meant for hot switching, but still, it's fun to try. 